Okay, we're going to move on to the next case now. So this is another variation on the cat and bat. Um, a bat was surrendered to an animal shelter on a weekend. The bat was acting normally. Uh, the shelter contacted a local wildlife rescue to pick up the bat. But when they came to get the bat the next day, the bat was no longer there. Uh, the, this was a shelter that housed 30 cats. Some were in individual cages and some were free range within the housing area so they could walk around. And the, um, if the bat were to have it tried to escape or escape successfully, it would have had to pass through the cat housing area. And none of the cats were vaccinated. So the shelter called the public health veterinarian for advice on this case. So again, we'll spend about a minute talking about this one and then we'll go on to the third cat bat case. And I just wanted to say, if any of you were involved personally in these cases, when we come back to the discussion, please speak up and tell us if there's anything we're missing. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to quickly move on to our third case now. Um, but before we move on to this case, I'd just like to say that once you see the third case, I want you to keep in mind what your group decided for the second case and um, make sure you have that noted separately. So if you change your mind, you know that you changed your mind. So this, whoops. So. Mm -hmm. Case number three, Northern Health Authority. A bat was displaying unusual behavior and attacked a cat and a person. The, the person contacted the Northern Health Authority. The bat was euthanized and submitted to the CFIA and came back positive. Um, the veterinarian called the public health vet for advice on managing the cat. So this cat had been previously vaccinated, but not since 2008. And this exposure occurred this summer. Uh, the cat received the rabies vaccine booster four days after the bat encounter. It was an outdoor cat and there was some concern about ability to quarantine the cat. So now we need to make decision on how we're going to manage this cat and then we're going to talk about that. So we'll do another minute and then we'll come back for a quick discussion. Okay, okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about what we did for the first case and then we'll open up for some, hello? I'm gonna talk about the first case and then we're gonna open up for discussion. So this case, obviously the thing that we needed to find out was whether the cats had been vaccinated or not. And this required, um, so the logical thing would be to ask the lady to talk to her veterinarian, but it turned out she'd been to four or five veterinary clinics in the last few years. And so it took a little bit of legwork to follow up and phone all those clinics and determine that the cats had not been vaccinated. Um, so then we had required uh, 
in this case, the MHO was notified because of, there might have been human contact and that was their decision to deal with. And also we did animal health management because the cats were not vaccinated. So we had the cats vaccinated, the bat was submitted for testing and in this case it was negative. So no further action was required. Now I put case two and three up because I think they're interesting because case two, um, Really, the difference between case two and case three is that the bat's not available for testing. So in case three, we know the bat's positive, so that, to me, made me more nervous about doing our recommended quarantine uh, because we already know the bat's positive. But really, in case two, we have 30 cats, some of which could have potentially been exposed to a bat, and we just don't know the result. So I'm wondering if anybody had any comments or thoughts on how they would manage them, or did how you manage case two change when you saw case three? We'll vaccinate them. Anybody else? So you said you'd vaccinate the 30 cats in the shelter, is that right? Yes. And then what about isolation and observation for those cats? Because obviously when you have 30 cats in a shelter, there's some significant implications for the shelter um, if they need to manage those cats as potential rabies suspects. I mean, on, on this one, um, these cats were, they were up for adoption um, and, and we discussed that they did receive the, first of all, they received the vaccination within, within the specified amount of time that they should have been. And then we, there was the question about whether they should be allowed to adopt out the cats or not. And our advice to them was that they could be adopted, but with full disclosure of the risk and that the owner would have to have the isolation and quarantine in their house. Otherwise, the cats would have to remain under isolation and quarantine within the shelter. The shelter didn't feel comfortable um, adopting out those cats with that proviso, with that disclosure, so they opted to keep all of the cats for the, for the full quarantine time and they actually had adopted out a cat already over the course of the weekend and they got that cat back to the shelter and kept it over the quarantine time. And this third uh, case, what did, and there was great discussion about, because of the concern about being able to isolate this cat that had clearly been exposed to a no one rabid bat, but in the end they were able to do the, uh, it was vaccinated and they were able to set up a quarantine that the EHO in the area was comfortable with, and so that's what happened. Um, is there any further discussion on those ones? Okay, nobody, nobody here was the person who managed those cases? No? Okay. Or wants to admit it. And so case four and five, this is something that we also see quite often. Uh, vaccines, they have to be 12 weeks of age for label. They're safe to give younger, but they probably might not respond because of a maternal antibodies. So case four was a 10-week-old puppy purchased from a pet store in Peru and imported to Canada. Uh, puppy was unwell since it was purchased. It had some salivation and champing of jaws and tremors. Uh, treated in a veterinary hospital for three days. At 48 hours, they became suspicious of rabies, and so they started to use um, sort of protective treatment at that time. And they had four staff involved with the puppy. Two had been vaccinated and two had not. And another case, a little bit, uh, not a clinical case, but similar, 10-week-old unvaccinated puppy in BC brought a dead bat in the house. So we'll just talk about how we would manage those cases for a couple minutes and then we'll come back together.
Okay. Uh, so, so for for case four. Uh, which is the puppy from Peru. The reason we put this case up is because we see an increasing number of dogs being imported from rabies endemic areas and there's always a risk that some of those dogs are going to come uh, with you know incubating rabies and so that's something that we're we need to be aware of as practitioners uh, veterinarian specifically. In this case they euthanized the puppy and the puppy was submitted for a rabies testing and um, luckily it came back negative so public health held off on doing any PEP until the results came back negative so they didn't have to do further action. And then case five we see a lot of puppies and kittens bringing um, bats into the house and so there really isn't a lot of scientific evidence about when we can vaccinate and when puppies and kittens will be protected versus maternal antibodies waning. So this is something we see quite often. And I think what uh, BCCDC has decided now is that we're going to recommend, they're going to recommend that those puppies are vaccinated immediately in case they're at a declining antibody level right at the time of exposure. But they're still going to need to have their normal set of booster vaccines at 12 to 16 weeks of age and again at a year. Okay, and I have one final case which is really a bit of a public health one. Um, and this is also indicative of some of the phone calls that we at the BCCDC has received over the summer and it's really a little bit about veterinary education. So a person was feeding a raccoon in Vancouver and it bit them. Uh, they visited the emergency room and the physician informed them that no ra raccoon rabies in BC, so no PEP was required. Uh, the person called their veterinarian with further questions and the veterinarian provided them with different information that raised their concern about possible exposure to rabies. And so then they contacted the public health veterinarian directly after speaking to their family veterinarian. And really the purpose of this case um, is just to illustrate that we, as veterinarians, we need to be careful that we have accurate information that we're sharing with um, our clients and that really the, what we ended up doing is referring that person to their physician and they were able to follow up with their physician and get appropriate human health care advice and I think that's something that we need to continue to encourage our veterinary practitioners to do. Um, so that's really it. And I don't know if there's any further, if anybody was involved in that case or if there's any further comments on that. No? Yes? Making them a little bit afraid, but it means that they're asking the questions. It means that. I don't know, I'm not a, a, a human medical doctor, but I would be very leery of saying that because there's no raccoon rabies in BC that there was no risk in this case, because raccoons can, there may be infection with a bat strain of rabies. So to say that there's no risk, go home, everything's okay, is, is a concern to me as well. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that veterinarians should be giving human medical advice, but I do think that the veterinarian did a good thing in raising the potential risk and the, the question of risk in this case. So I guess we see quite a lot of similar cases like this with animal exposure where a raccoon attacks a cat. Usually related, raccoons are aggressive and it's usually re related to food conflict. And in those cases, we do, in our guidelines, we do not recommend that the animal be, have its rabies vaccine boosted unless it's never been vaccinated and we're doing it prophylactically for other reasons. So I think we need to think about sort of how those two policies would integrate and if we're confident saying we don't need to booster the animals then we need to be confident with the same messaging.
Thank you very much. We unfortunately don't have